Right guys, welcome to Social Influence Lesson 5. This is the second lesson in the Obedience series and is going to be looking at situational variables. If you missed the first lesson, it's linked at the top of your screen now and I would suggest having a quick look at it because the content in this video follows on from the last one. So for example, it'll be good for you to have a little bit of knowledge on how Milgram's baseline procedure worked. You can see what we're going to cover in the description below and if you want to jump to a specific bit, you can use the timestamps to do so. And of course, before we get started, please hit that like button if you find the video useful. So, if you remember from the last lesson, after Milgram conducted his baseline experiment, he came to the conclusion that the events of the Second World War didn't have anything to do with German people being fundamentally more obedient than other people. Because in his experiment, he found that American participants were also very obedient, even when they were asked to do harm. So, because of that, he suspected that there were certain factors in a situation that encouraged obedience. So, he decided to conduct further studies to investigate those factors. These are known as situational variables, and they are features of the immediate physical and social environment that may influence a person's behaviour for one reason or another. And the three features that Milgram specifically focused on, and that we are going to look at in this video, are location, proximity, and uniform. Okay, so for each of these, Milgram conducted a variation of his study, and each of those variations have got their own findings and their own explanations for those findings, all of which we're going to go through in this video. The first variation is the change of location. Now, originally, Milgram conducted his experiment at Yale University, a very prestigious location, well-known and respected in academic circles. In the location variation, Milgram moved his experiment to a rundown office block, and in that scenario, obedience levels dropped from the original 65% to 47.5. Now, that's thought to be due to the university setting giving the study legitimacy and authority. Participants were more obedient at Yale because they perceived that the experimenter shared the legitimacy and that obedience was expected. However, obedience levels were still quite high in the office block, and that's thought to be because the participants were aware of the scientific nature of the procedure, and of course because the researcher, who's also associated with the institution and is an authority figure, was also present. Okay, it's just like being on a school trip. School is a legitimate setting where obedience is expected. When you're on a school trip, however, the setting's changed. It's still something that's associated with school, and the teacher's still there, so obedience isn't going to drop massively, but the location has less legitimacy, and so obedience levels are not necessarily going to be as high as they would be in school. Now, the second variation is the proximity variation, and this was all about the distance between the learner, the teacher, and the authority figure, and how a change in that distance could affect obedience. In Milgram's baseline study, the teacher and the learner were in separate rooms, so the teacher could hear the learner, but couldn't see him. In Milgram's proximity variation, that was changed in a number of different ways. So in one version, the teacher and the learner were in the same room, and the obedience rates dropped from the original 65 to 40%. There was also a version in which the learner had to place their own hand onto an electric shock plate if they got the answer wrong. And if they refused to do that, the teacher had to force the learner's hand onto the plate. That was called the touch proximity variation, and in that one, obedience dropped further to 30%. And in a final version, the experimenter actually left the room and gave instructions to the teacher via telephone. That was called the remote instruction variation, and obedience levels dropped again to 20.5%. The reduced obedience is thought to be because the decreased proximity allows people to psychologically distance themselves from the consequences of their actions. So, for example, when the teacher and the learner were in different rooms, as was the case in the baseline study, the teacher was less aware of the harm they were causing, and so they were more obedient. In the remote instruction variation, a similar thing happens, but in this case, the authority of the experimenter becomes less apparent because he's further away. A bit like when a teacher leaves the room and says, don't talk, I'll be right back. But realistically, what are they going to do 
if you do talk, they're not there. Okay, so it's the same kind of principle here when the experimenter leaves the room. And then finally, we have the uniform variation. Now, in Milgram's baseline study, the experimenter wore a grey lab coat as a symbol of his authority, which is basically a uniform. And in the uniform variation, the experimenter is called away at the start of the experiment because of an inconvenient phone call or something like that. And then the role of the experimenter is then taken over by an ordinary member of the public, who is a confederate of the researcher. That member of the public is wearing everyday clothes rather than a lab coat. Now, in this variation, obedience rates drop to 20%, the lowest of all of the variations that we've discussed so far. Now, the reason why uniforms hold such influence is because they encourage obedience as their widely recognized symbols of authority. We accept that someone in a uniform is entitled to expect obedience because their authority is legitimate. It's almost decided by society that they are an authority figure because they're wearing a uniform. On the other side of that, someone without a uniform has less right to expect our obedience. Okay, Hence why somebody in everyday clothing commands less obedience than somebody who's wearing a grey lab coat. Okay, And then just in keeping with the other two examples, I'm sure I don't have to tell you what would happen if a teacher left the room and put an unknown, normally dressed person in control who doesn't have any sort of symbol of authority about them. Okay, Carnage is what would happen. Okay, so those are all of Milgram's variations that you need to know about. Just before we move on to the second part of the video, you can see the results of the different variations here just in a bar chart. The baseline study produced the highest level of obedience at 65%, and then each of the variations we've talked about produced a lower percentage, with the change of location being the one that has the smallest impact, and the removal of the uniform having the greatest impact. Okay? Make sure that you remember for an outline or an application question or something like that. There are three parts pretty much to every one of these variations. You've got the procedure, then the findings, and then the explanation for those findings. And it's the explanations that are very, very important because not only will you need them for essays and outlines and that kind of thing, but they're the ones that also very often come up in application questions. Okay? So let's move right on to the evaluation points. I've got five of them for you, but obviously you can pick and choose which ones you want to use. Just make sure that you have a good mix of strengths and limitations. So our first strength of the impact of uniform was presented by Bickman in 1974. Bickman conducted a field experiment where Confederates stood on the street and asked members of the public to perform small tasks like picking up a piece of litter or something like that. The outfit that the Confederate was wearing varied from a smart suit jacket and tie to a milkman's outfit and then a security guard's uniform. And it was found that the public were twice as likely to obey the order given by the security guard than they were the other two uniforms. Okay, And that supports Milgram's idea that a uniform adds to the legitimacy of an authority figure and it is a situational variable which increases obedience levels. Okay, This is a nice evaluation point to remember, and if my experience tells me anything, this is one that you probably will remember for the next couple of years, because for some reason it's just one that sticks in people's heads. Okay, Bickman, field experiment, uniform. Okay. Another strength of Milgram's research is that his findings have been replicated in other cultures. So, for example, in a Dutch study, participants were ordered to say stressful things to someone in an interview who was desperate for a job. And the results showed that 90% of the participants obeyed. Furthermore, the researcher also replicated Milgram's findings concerning proximity in the same study. And they found that when the person giving the orders wasn't present, obedience levels decreased dramatically. And that suggests that Milgram's findings about obedience are not just limited to Americans or males, but are valid across cultures and apply to females as well. However, a counterpoint to that is the question of whether Milgram's replications are actually cross-cultural. Because Smith and Bond, 
identified just two replications that were conducted between 1968 and 1985 that took place in non-Western countries, and those were India and Jordan. Other countries that have been involved fairly often are countries like Spain, Australia and Scotland, and they're not actually that culturally different from the United States. Neither is Holland, by the way, which is where the study in the last evaluation point was conducted. They all have very similar notions about the role of authority. Therefore, it may not be appropriate to conclude that Milgram's findings, including those about proximity, location, and uniform, applied to all people in all cultures, because actually the majority of the replications have been done in Western individualist cultures. Okay, so even though it's been done in other countries, it's not necessarily different cultures, and therefore his results might not be actually that cross-culturally applicable. Okay. Another limitation, and this is one that was also an issue in Milgram's baseline study, is that the participants may have been aware that the procedure was fake. Orn and Holland, who also criticised Milgram's original study, point out that it's even more likely that participants may have worked out the procedure was fake in the variations because of the extra manipulation of the variables. A nice example is the variation where the experimenter is replaced by a member of the public, because it's so contrived that participants may well have worked out the truth. Because how likely is it that a member of the public who's got nothing to do with the university or got nothing to do with the study is just going to walk in and take over the study? It's just not very believable. Therefore, arguably, in all of Milgram's studies, it's unclear whether the findings are genuinely due to obedience or because the participants cottoned on to the deception that was going on and just responded to demand characteristics. Okay, so we have low internal validity. And then finally, although Milgram's research supports the idea that people obey because of pressures in the situation... Mandel, 1998, argues that this perspective provides an excuse for destructive obedience. It gives people the chance to say things like, I was just following orders, which means that people can excuse their antisocial and destructive behaviour because they can argue that it wasn't their fault. Furthermore, Milgram's perspective overlooks the role of dispositional factors, like personality characteristics, something that we're going to look at when we do the authoritarian personality. The fact is, some people may be more obedient as a consequence of genetics or because of their upbringing, and those factors may be just as important in determining whether people obey authority as situational variables are. So that suggests that Milgram's explanation based solely on situational factors is likely to oversimplify the causes of obedience. Also, it has to be said that attributing destructive behaviour and atrocities like the Holocaust to situational pressures alone, whilst ignoring the role of dispositional factors and all the other potential factors that could influence somebody's obedience levels, could also be argued to be offensive to survivors of such atrocities. Okay, so we have to be really, really careful about trying to explain away certain behaviours using very oversimplified theories. Okay, and this is, of course, a limitation of the theory and of the research. Okay. Right then, just to finish off, here is an example six mark outline. I'm not going to read it to you. Obviously, feel free to pause the video and give it a quick read if you want. Obviously, this isn't the only way that you could do a six marker. It's just an example. I have highlighted the important elements in bold so that you can see what I consider to be the key elements. Importantly here, I've not given every single bit of detail for every variation. For some of them, I've given the procedure, the findings, and the explanation, but for others, I've just given some of those things. Remember, it's all about breadth and depth. Okay. Also, a nice little introductory sentence is always something that I quite like. Some people don't think it's important, but I always just think it's quite nice to just put one sentence at the beginning just to kind of lead in to what you're talking about. Okay. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or anything snazzy, just something that sets the scene. <laughs> 
Like I said, there are other ways that you could do this outline. This is just one example that shows how you could do it. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's been useful and I hope it's all made sense. If you have any questions, please let me know by sticking them in the comment section below and I will get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you in the next one.